Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we're we're going to begin our talk now, guys. Um, my name is Jackson Sparks. I'm the co-director of the Natural Sciences Fellows Program. Uh, here to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dr. Tyrone Hayes is going to be uh, the president of the Natural Sciences Fellows, Amaya Anthony. And so I'm going to have her introduce Dr. Hayes. <coughs> Good morning. Good morning. Hope you're doing well. This is Dr. D Dr. Tyrone B. Hayes. He is a biologist and professor at, well, excuse me. He is a biologist and professor of integrative biology at UC Berkeley, and he is an advocate for critical review and regulation of pesticides and other chemicals that may cause adverse health effects. He is originally from South Carolina, and he attended the same high school as Dr. Sparks. He earned his biology degrees from Harvard, and he has a PhD from Berkeley. He has presented hundreds of papers, talks, and seminars on his conclusions that environmental chemical contaminants have played a role in global amphibian declines and in the health disparities that occur in minority and low-income populations. He has also won several awards for his teaching and his research, including the Distinguished Teaching Award from Berkeley in 2002, and the Jennifer Altman Award in 2005. Dr. Hayes is an engaging, passionate speaker, and we are very fortunate to host him today. Please welcome Dr. Hayes. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, it's my honor to virtually be there. Um, I would love to be there in person. Um, as we know, these are trying times. Um, I, I also, before I begin, I have a, a I, I will admit a few things to you. Um, one, this is my first long distance talk. I've done one conference before um, and my first on WebEx. I've, I've over the last few weeks gotten used to Zoom. So now we have a new format for me as well. Um, I also want to acknowledge that this is your time. So I've prepared a slide deck to go through, um, but I'm also prepared to have much more discussion and happy to talk about anything else. So I think what I'm gonna try to do is start up the slides and start the presentation, but I will stop at convenient time points for discussion and to, to sort of readjust and redirect our conversation in ways that you might wanna have it. 
So if I can, um, let's see, this, this looks easy enough. If I can share and So, okay. So, okay, sorry, it's asking, the computer's asking me a number of things. Can everybody see my slides? Yeah, yes, yeah, so we can see it. Okay, I want to. I want to first start. I always start by acknowledging. I, I'll give a abbreviated acknowledgement, but I want to thank my my family uh, for their love and support over these fifty three years. And I also want to um, acknowledge my funders, but probably most importantly, I want to acknowledge all of the students that have been involved that have worked in my lab. Um, and of course, it's the students who really do the work. I'm the one who talks about it. Um, my story starts and ends as it is with a little boy, as you heard, I'm from South Carolina, and it starts and ends with a little boy who likes frogs. And after all this time that's and 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 everything that I've that I've done and gone through, that's still the way I think of myself. This is a I always start with a picture of this book. This is a book that my mom gave me or gave my son actually when my son was born. And and she says this was my favorite book when I was a little kid. And I don't remember the book, but I have been interested in frogs and interested in biology and, and really interested in the study of life for as long as I can remember. It's been a lifelong passion for me. And we will. Okay, the slides aren't moving for some reason. Okay, sorry. So we'll we'll skip maybe the first 25 years or so of, of that journey in the interest of time. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll go here to Africa, to Kenya specifically. And in addition to being fascinated by frogs and animals and, and, and wanting to study life as a, as a little kid, I was also most of my life fascinated by Africa, by reading stories about Africa and, and watching television shows about animals in Africa, and especially watching and reading National Geographic. National Geographic, they didn't have a television um, uh, series back then, but there was a National Geographic show that I watched every week along with shows like Wild Kingdom. And in my graduate career, I finally got the opportunity to go to Africa, to actually travel out of the country and to go to Africa. And not only did I get to go to Africa, but I was funded by the National Geographic program. I became a National Geographic um, what's called Emerging Explorer. I got to be in the commercial for, for its Toyota driving a truck in Africa. I got to be in the magazine. I got to be on the show. If you can imagine literally your childhood dreams coming true, if you can imagine literally becoming that guy that I dreamed about watching those shows every Sunday night, that was my experience as a graduate student. It changed my life in, in many, many ways. Um, I got to work at a place called the Arabuku Sokoke. And it's a it's a protected forest along the coast in Kenya that kind of extends down in, into Tanzania. And it was there. I actually went there to work on African bullfrogs for a project that failed because I couldn't catch the animals and I couldn't get them to breed. But but what I did end up doing is discovering the species Hyperoleus argus. And Hyperoleus argus is this fascinating species because it the males and the females look completely different. And, and, and just that aspect of the species alone fascinated me. We brought some animals back to the laboratory. And again, my interests are in understanding the role that hormones play in reproductive development and physiology in amphibians. And so I became very interested in how the species comes to be differently colored. The first thing we discovered is that they all start out green. So this is the same individual photographed digitally once a day in the laboratory for six days. And so they all start out green, but the females, the individuals with ovaries, change color at sexual maturity. 
And so, you know, just out of curiosity, we were interested in how this happened. We hypothesized that this color change was regulated by estrogen, by estradiol. In the same way that in humans, when, when females reach puberty, estrogen stimulates growth of the breasts, and you'll see how relevant that, that analogy is. We propose that estrogen regulated color change in, in this frog. And so we tested that really simply just by dipping frogs in hormone solutions. And we found out that in fact, we can induce a premature, premature color change in these frogs just by dipping them in a solution of estrogen. Now, that, that changed my, my life profoundly in part because this is a photograph of my son on the day he was born. Because on the day before my son was born, my wife was at a talk. I was giving a talk at um, UC Davis, University of California, Davis, on my color changing frog. And, and, and my wife literally started having contractions and going into labor during my talk. And on the way driving back from that talk at UC Davis, my wife said, you should patent that frog. I, and I thought that was a crazy idea, but it turns out you can't patent a frog, but you can patent a process. So we did, we called it the Hyperlizargus, that's the species, endocrine screen or the ACES. And here's why you patent a frog. So here's a control, right? So this is, they all start out green and they're about the size of your pinky nail, by the way. These, these aren't big frogs, they're, they're pretty tiny frogs. So not only did we show that if you dip them in natural estrogen, estradiol, so this is the estrogen that circulates in, in everybody. It doesn't matter if you're a fish, a dog, a frog, a cat, or a hog. If, if you are a reproductively mature female, the, this hormone circulates in your blood, the estrogen. But we also found that if you dip them in ethanyl estradiol, the synthetic estrogen that's used in birth control pill, they'll change color. If you dip them in diestyl stilbestrol, DES, a very potent synthetic pharmaceutical estrogen, used in humans or used to be, they'll change color. And if you dip them in DDT, even a pesticide that just happens to mimic estrogen, that's a so-called endocrine disruptor, they'll change color. So that's why you, so that's what we patented was this process of, of being able to detect estrogens just by dipping a frog in a solution. Now it turns out the reason that this is important is that every estrogen and we screened dozens of compounds every compound that was estrogenic in my frog that made my frog change color was also known to promote breast cancer which is estrogen dependent so we could use this frog to screen chemicals that might be potential breast cancer promoters or we could even you know you could send me a sample of your water i could dip my frog in it if it changes color well you might not want to drink your tap water what's more is we showed that we could block the color change by treating frogs with tamoxifen, and tamoxifen is an estrogen receptor blocker. So not only could we identify compounds with this little African frog, not only could we identify compounds in days that might be that might be breast cancer promoters, but we could also identify compounds that would block estrogen and might be used to treat breast cancer. And that changed my life in an unbelievable way because see the first thing is i then got introduced to what i call grown-up words grown-up words tend to come in twos i think i'm making that up but in this case the grown-up word was intellectual property so you may not realize that if you're a student or if you're a faculty if you're employed by a university you sign over what's called intellectual property that means that if you have a creative idea the university owns it. So they weren't in my laboratory dipping frogs and taking care of all those frogs, but they own the intellectual property. And what the demand was is that you have to show how you can monetize this idea. How can you make money from this idea? And that's when my life dramatically changed. I got introduced to a little company called Novartis, of being obnoxious. They're actually the largest chemical company in the world hired us to use frogs to try to determine, they wanted to know, is atrazine, their number one selling product shown here, is it an endocrine disruptor? Does it interfere with hormones? And they wanted us to use frogs. So a little background on atrazine, and this is about 20 years ago that this started. It's an herbicide, so it's a weed killer used mostly on corn in this country. It's been used since 1958, so it's been around for quite some time. 
We use 80 million pounds in the United States per year, and it's used in more than 80 countries. So it's a fairly widespread chemical. It's now outlawed in all of Europe, or the company's lawyer would like for me to say it has been denied regulatory approval by the European Union. I'm not really sure what the difference is, um, but <laughs> that's what the lawyer demands. So what they asked us to do is they asked us to work on another African frog, the African clawed frog, because the African clawed frog is um, a little more established in the scientific world. It's the most common frog used in science for an odd reason, it turns out. It turns out that the African clawed frog will respond to the human pregnancy hormone HCG by laying eggs. So in 1940, this frog was literally the pregnancy test. If you thought you were pregnant, you would go to the doctor and they would inject some urine into this frog. And if it laid eggs, you were pregnant. If it didn't lay eggs, you were not. And I, I tell this story for three reasons. One is it shows you the value of curiosity-based research, right? So there had to be some guy who was discovered in 1920 that, that just decided he was going to inject, inject pee into a frog. Like where the idea came from or what the hypothesis was, I have no idea, but it shows you it was a valuable discovery. Um, it also shows you the similarity between human hormones and frog hormones. The estrogens that promote breast cancer in my frog, I mean, that, sorry, that, that promote color change in my frog are exactly identical to the estrogens that promote breast cancer in humans. And likewise, the human pregnancy hormone is so similar to frogs that it'll make these African clawed frogs lay eggs. And in fact, the, the, third, the third reason that this is important is that when they develop new pregnancy tests, people just threw these frogs out. So they're actually resident in California. So I can actually go to San Diego and, and collect these frogs without having to pay for them and then use them in my research. In fact, that's what we did. In fact, I jokingly call my African clawed frogs African-American clawed frogs because, well, it's irrelevant to the story. So the first thing we discovered was that atrazine inhibited growth of the voice box in male African clawed frogs. And these data implied that atrazine was an endocrine disruptor that blocked testosterone. Because the same reason that in general, men have deeper voices than women, male frogs sing and female frogs don't because of testosterone and because of its effects on the voice box early in development. We then went on to show um, that in fact, the gonads were impaired when these animals were exposed to atrazine. So these are the gonads. I think you can see my arrow here. Except these are testes, which should be there if you're a male. But then this frog also has ovaries, then it has a large testis, then it has more ovaries. <laughs> That's not normal. And, and, I, and I make this point because the company that produces atrazine has argued that it's a naturally occurring phenomenon. It's not. I have examined, without exaggeration, tens of thousands of frogs, probably hundreds of thousands at this point, and it's not, it does not normally occur. Um, you may have learned from Jurassic Park that frogs are naturally hermaphroditic. That is not true. That's science fiction. There are fish that have testes that no reason the same individual, i.e. hermaphrodites, but not in frogs. So we hypothesized that what was happening was that testosterone, which is the hormone, the quote male hormone, in fact, the word testosterone literally means testicular hormone. It's quote the male hormone. Um, and that's what should come out of, the, out of the testis. Our hypothesis was that atrazine turns on the enzyme aromatase that converts testosterone into estrogen. And, and as a result, the animals are demasculinized because their testosterone is being used up and they're subsequently feminized because now they're making estrogen inappropriately. And, and we could show this. So we measured testosterone levels in controlled males and then atrazine treated adult males, and then here's females. We published a paper and at, at this point in my career, I was actually coming up for tenure. So, and I did some other stuff, but we published a paper in PNAS, which probably helped a lot that, that, that the um, media attention and the scientific um, attention that the paper got. Um, hermaphroditic demasculinized frogs after exposure to the herbicide atrazine at low ecologically relevant doses. By this time, the, the company wasn't supporting me anymore. Um, 
And it's funny, I remember calling my mom, you know, because I was so proud of my, you know, paper in the National Academy and PNAS. I remember my mom saying, how important is that paper? You know, I said, what do you mean? She says, well, I went to Barnes and Noble. And they, they never heard of that magazine. <laughs> so, but nevertheless, it, it was pretty important to me. As important as the paper was, it didn't answer two questions. It didn't tell us if these hermaphrodites were males with ovaries or females with testes, because frogs don't have sex chromosomes. So we couldn't tell who was genetically male and who was um, uh, genetically female. And we also didn't know what happens when these animals become, become adults it takes these animals about four or five years to grow up and you know you have to get students that are going to be around this that long so in summary we put we eventually published a second paper showing the following um we, we grew these animals up and when they reached adults uh, here's what looks like a uh well what you would assume is a genetically male and female copulating in fact by the time the paper was published and a gene had been identified that only females have a gene called dmw and, and so we could actually show for sure that this animal, you know, who looks like he's smiling there, is a genetic male because he's missing that DMW gene. And, and this is his brother, who is completely, I think I have another slide, not only behaves like a female, but physiologically lays eggs and everything just like a genetic female. So they're genetically male, but as a result of we believe producing estrogen in response to atrazine, they've grown ovaries instead of testes and have function. Then we did a series of studies that I call the pool party experiments, where we asked of those males that were exposed to atrazine that didn't turn into females, were they reproductively functional? And so in these experiments, we, we literally took four females, you know, four genetically unexposed females, four unexposed males and four atrazine exposed males and asked, can these atrazine exposed males compete for and copulate with females? So, so we literally, we put them in these, in these kiddie pools. So you can see there, the lights go out at 7 p.m. And then we come back in the morning and we just see we have surgical stitches so we can tell which individual is which individual. And we, we just look at who's copulating, like you know this guy is, and, and who's not. And when you do that, you find out that the atrazine treated males, and so we did four trials, of, of this, and we found out the atrazine treated males almost never get the female. What's more is if you look at the hormone levels for all the frogs involved across all four trials, so there are 16 animals here, the average testosterone level is lower in the atrazine treated males, as, as you might guess. But if you look at the individual levels and look at who made the love connection, it turns out there's sort of a threshold level of testosterone. And if you're below this level, such as all these atrazine treated males, either the females don't like you. Okay, so here are some controls that naturally didn't, you know, just didn't have enough hormone. Either the females don't like you or the other males in the tank beat you up. But the point is you don't get the female. What's more is we did this, we then did a series of experiments that I call the Motel 6 experiments. And, and in these Motel 6 experiments, in this case, there was no competition. We just mixed individual males and females together in these rooms. You know, we gave them a room. And then we asked, even if there's no competition, can the atrazine treated males, can they, are they fertile? Can they mate with and, and fertilize eggs? <clears throat> so here's what that looks like. Females lay about 2,000 eggs. <clears throat> and the procedure is fairly complicated. So here's an unfertilized egg. And, and, and these are eggs at various stages of development, so they were fertilized. And, and we, we have to calculate the fertility rate by, by comparing the number of unfertilized to fertilized eggs. And I'm being obnoxious, it's not a complicated procedure at all. There's an undergrad sitting there all day going one, two, three. I think he went on to become an accountant or something like that. So here, here are the results, and then it all gets re reduced to two bar graphs. So here are the results. Control males fertilize about 85% of a female's eggs. Atrazine treated males only about 15%. So they're severely, even if there's no competition, they're severely impaired. And they're impaired because of two reasons. One, they don't even try. They don't even attempt to mate with the females. They don't even show the, 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 the behavior for mating with the female. But what's more is even if they do, here's what their testis looks like under the microscope compared to controls. 
And if I blow this up, this has sperm resident in the testicular tubule. So see, that's a tubule. And the, the, all those dark circles, those are all the sperm heads all lined up. So just like we have as humans. But as the atrazine treated animals, there's just cellular debris mostly in their testicular tubules. So they don't have enough testosterone to show the behavior. And even if they did, they don't have enough testosterone to, to maintain sperm production. So we published another paper, um, atrazine induces complete feminization and chemical castration in male African frog frogs. I'm laughing because the company hates the word chemical castration. That's why I put it in the title. The other thing that's important is that nine undergraduates were involved in this research, and every one of them now has either an MD, a PhD, or both. And, and I'm very proud of that, and also an incredibly diverse group of students. So the last thing I'll tell you about is we did studies in North American frogs. This is a leopard frog. And, and here are testes. And instead of becoming hermaphrodites, they have testes, but they grow up and, and have these vitiligenic or yoked up eggs in their testes. So they have testes, testes, but they make eggs instead of sperm, which, which is not normal. And then we evaluated this in the wild. And so to give you an idea of, of, what, we're, of what we're talking about in terms of levels, the package of atrazine recommends usage at 2.9 to 29 million parts per billion. Okay? We're using 0.1 part per billion in my laboratory. So the level that's applied in the environment is 290 million times higher than we're using in my lab. And, and, and this is a log scale. And what I'm going to show you now are levels that are measured in agricultural runoff, temporary pools, permanent water, and precipitation. And here's the levels, again, that we're using in my lab. So even rain, even rainwater would put animals at risk based on the levels that we find are active in my laboratory. And here's what really got the Environmental Protection Agency and the company up in arms. The drinking water standard is 30 times higher than what we know to be biologically active in, in frogs and later you'll see fish. And so here animals, this is now not from my lab, this is from the wild. So there's a testis, okay, sitting on the kidney. If we slice that up and put it under the microscope, they have what we call testicular oocytes. So you can see there's a testicular tubule, except instead of sperm in there, like I showed you with the control males, these animals have eggs in their testicular tubules. So we did this study across the United States where we show that everywhere we find atrazine, and it's mostly used in the Midwest, you know, so we did this transect across the US. Everywhere we find atrazine, we find these hermaphroditic frogs and vice versa. And we eventually published that in, in, in Nature, and that's the last frog study I'll tell you. And I'll stop there to see if there are questions, and, and if you wanna go on to talk about some of the human implications um, for atrazine. Now I just have to figure out how Okay. Um, I can't figure out how to get back to you. <laughs> so, so can you hear us, Tyrone? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Um, well, if, if anybody has any questions about his frog research, now is a good time to do that. Um, if you ask the question sort of closer to the microphone up here, you'll probably be picked up better, but we can try to project from back there too. And if not, I can go on and talk about the public health implications um, to humans, what, whatever's your preference. We have a question over here, Christina. Um, I kind of had like a really general question. Like, mm -hmm. Find your research topic. How do you get started on actually researching? Well, I've, I've been kind of researching the same thing all my life. As an undergraduate, I was I was involved in a number of programs and funded undergraduate research. So I could not have afforded to work in a lab and go to school and you know, volunteer to do research. Um, in graduate school, I had fellowships that was supported by the my graduate professor. Um, and and then after that, as a as a professor, you have to raise um, your own funding. And in this case, my funding initiated from. The chemical company has been sponsored. So you want to hear about more about the public health related sure. stuff. Um, 
and the main reason I call this from Silent Spring to Silent Night. Let's see, we're booting up. Yeah. Is so Silent Spring was about the death of birds and the role of pesticides and and how you know our our silent spring was you know no more birds singing and for those of you who don't know um frogs are declining at an alarming rate something like 80 percent of all amphibian species are declining and in threat a threat of extinction so the idea of silent night is is addressing the relative role that pesticides and chemical contaminants have in those amphibian declines so a colleague of mine wrote a few years back in ecoepidemiology, the occurrence of an association in more than one species and species population is very strong evidence for causation. So I've, I've talked to you about multiple frog, not just populations actually, but multiple species, genera, and I've studied animals across phylogenetic families. Um, so, and it's not just correlational data, we have experimental data. But what I'm gonna tell you about now is that Effects, similar effects of atrazine have been demonstrated in every vertebrate class that's that's been examined. And probably because what atrazine does, I won't go through this whole thing, is um, but this is work I published with a lab in Japan, is atrazine blocks phosphodiesterase, leading to an increase in cyclic AMP and the expression of aromatase, the enzyme that makes estrogen, that transcriptional regulation of aromatase is it's regulated by cyclic AMP. So by blocking phosphodiesterase and increasing cyclic AMP, you get ultimately an increase in aromatase and an increase in estrogen production. What's significant is that's the way estrogen is regulated in every animal from fish to reptiles and amphibians, humans. So when we see this effect in amphibians, and in fact, we discovered the molecular um, regulation in mammals, you'd expect that this effect would occur across species and that's what we showed so this is a group of i believe there were 32 of us from 12 different countries published a paper examining data across animals in a, in, in a comparative way so here's the testes of amphibians which i just showed you sperm in the testes give it atrazine there's no sperm this, this is work in fish that was done in belgium this is work in reptiles in in uh, cayman it's like a big alligator that was done in argentina this is work in mammals that was done originally in Nigeria and Croatia. Again, sperm in the testes, give it atrazine, no sperm. And this is work in Pakistan on birds, on quail, sperm in the testes, give it atrazine, no sperm. So, so this declining sperm production that we noted in amphibians was being shown in animals across the phylogenetic, phylogenetic spectrum and, and in multiple, multiple countries. Now, the sperm production, which is presumably due to testosterone reduction, which we also showed in frogs, has also been shown in fish in a group in England. There's my work on frogs and had been shown on rats. Ironically, the rat work was done in the labs that were funded by the, by the company. In humans now, what, what I'm showing is that there's a significant correlation between atrazine contamination in the semen and infertility in men. So men who have more atrazine in their, in their sperm um, have trouble getting their wives pregnant and low sperm count. And this is work that was done in Columbia, Missouri. Now, if I squash this down, and, and, and here comes the environmental justice, environmental racism piece. Because if you look at atrazine levels that were studied in men in California, these are field workers. Now I squash this down again. So these data are still there. These are men who apply atrazine, 2,400 parts per billion. So they have 24,000 times the atrazine in their urine that we know is associated with, with low sperm count in men in Columbia, Missouri. So in other words, one of these guys could pee in a bucket and I could use the atrazine in their urine to chemically castrate and feminize 24,000 buckets of 30 tadpoles each. Of course, most of these men, um, most of these men are, are Latinx, the men who grow our food in California and, and the targets. And in addition to atrazine, we know that they're exposed to chemicals that have adverse health outcomes. 
chemicals like chlorpicrin, which was originally developed as a nerve gas in, in World War II. Um, chemicals that were, were used in Agent Orange in, in warfare time during um, our war in Vietnam and Cambodia. So in California, and, and, and this gets at the environmental justice piece a little more, we are the fifth largest economy in the world. Well, I don't know where we stand now, but it, at the time I made this slide, we were the fifth largest economy in the world because of agriculture, not because of tech or Hollywood, but because one in 10 jobs are in ag in California. 30% of the land is in ag. We produce 350 agricultural products, and I didn't know this, but half of the United States' food comes out of California. So half of all the food you eat was grown in California. We use more pesticides than any other state, and 90% of the workers are Latinx. So if on this map, I, I, I put in red now here the top 10 counties for agriculture. So this is the 30% of where your 50% of your food comes from. So technically, these are the counties that make us the fifth richest country in the world, California alone. Where do you think <clears throat> the 30 poorest towns are in California? So the people who make us the fifth largest economy in the world are also the people who are taking on these chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. Life expectancy in some farm working communities can be as low as 40, age 40, in part because of the hazards associated with chemical use. On the other side of the equation, does atrazine induce aromatase and estrogen production um, in, in, in mammals, the way that in humans in particular, the way we've seen in other animals? Now, you're not going to grow eggs in your testes, but we know that estrogen is associated with breast cancer and prostate cancer. With regards to prostate cancer, they showed in one of their own factories that there's an 8.4 fold higher increase in prostate cancer in men who work in their factories bagging atrazine. This is a community, by the way, in, in San Gabriel, Louisiana, where 80% of the people who live there are black, low-income African-Americans. So again, environmental justice issue. There's an association between breast cancer and atrazine exposure with a p-value of less than 0 0.0001. This is a study done in Kentucky of women whose well water is contaminated with atrazine. And that's just correlation, but the company themselves have shown that if you expose rats to atrazine, testosterone goes down, just like we showed. And there's a concomitant increase in estrogen in rats, just like we showed. What's more is another study showed, and this is, again, done by people who work for the company, that rats exposed to atrazine have a higher incidence of breast cancer or mammary cancer. It's just a correlation, but you know, I told you in the beginning that I study frogs because I'm just a little boy who likes frogs. I'm pretty sure that people who study rats weren't little boys or girls who like rats. They study rats because they tell us something about humans as mammals. What we also know in humans is that if you take a human cell line, in this case, a cancer cell line, that doesn't make aromatase and estrogen, and now you give it atrazine, it'll start making estrogen just like we've seen in frogs, just like we've seen in fish, just like we've seen in rats, human cell lines respond the same way to atrazine. Now, I've gone to visit them many times. <laughs> they, they wouldn't let me in. There's a pipe that runs from their facility that goes straight into the Mississippi River. And it turns out that, that, that something like a half million pounds of atrazine flow into the Gulf of Mexico through the Mississippi River every year. And as far as I know, nobody's really studying the impact on the fish and, and things that come out of the Gulf. The community, as I told you, which is 80% Black, 80% African-American, much of it looks like this. And it's, and it's an area that's known as Cancer Alley. Now what I'm showing you, and then I'll stop after this if there's more questions, but now what I'm showing you is um, these are the top 13 cancers that you're going to get living in the United States. And red now, 11 out of the 13 are ones that you're more likely to get if you're black, statistically, if you're African American. And this is control for socioeconomic status and access to health care, which makes things even worse. Um, and now, relative to white or Caucasian Americans, if you're black, you're more likely to die from 13 out of 13, the top 13 cancers. 
we now know, any doctor will tell you now, who knows that cancer is an environmental disease. Less than 30% of cancer can be explained by genetics, okay? So that means that when your doctor tells you that you're more likely to get breast cancer if your sister or your mother or somebody else in your family has it, they're not telling you that you have bad genes. They're telling you that you've been exposed to the same crap as the rest of your family. And if you're low-income immigrant or minority, you're more likely to live in areas and more likely to work in areas where you're exposed to chemicals that we know are associated with adverse health outcomes. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna skip ahead. I wanna show you one last thing. Oh, no, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and show you this. And then I'll open for questions. That one last thing I want to show you is, this is a gel. This is a gel from one of my students graduate students and what it's showing is <clears throat> that if you take breast cancer cell lines and give them aromatase they also ex uh, sorry you give them atrazine they express aromatase just like all these other cell lines and animals that that we talked about the reason that that's significant is and, the, and one of the things that the company really got upset for me for pointing out is that Right now, the number one treatment for breast cancer is a chemical called letrozole that blocks aromatase. So right now, if you get breast cancer or your mother or someone in your family gets breast cancer, they will be given a drug that decreases aromatase activity so that you have less estrogen so that your breast cancer doesn't spread. The irony is the number one contaminant of drinking water and rainwater, et cetera, is a chemical called atrazine that does exactly the opposite, that increases estrogen in every animal that's been studied, and that's associated with breast cancer and induces breast cancer in rats. Well, it turns out Novartis, the same company makes both chemicals. The same company, as of the year 2000 anyway, the same company that sold atrazine sold letrozole. The same company that was selling a chemical to block your aromatase and treat breast cancer was selling a chemical that induced aromatase and was associated with breast cancer. So I think what's happened is that my interest in this aquatic organism has accidentally taught me a lot about this aquatic organism. We now know that you will be exposed to several hundred chemicals before you even leave the womb. Atrazine just being one of those that can be detected in amniotic fluid. And the best thing about atrazine is that we know it's not good for you. Most of these chemicals, we have no information. The last thing I want to show you is the following, because it really had an impact on me. Again, we study rats because we want to learn something about humans. Atrazine has been shown to induce prostate and mammary cancer in rats, to cause immune failure in rats, to cause neural damage in rats exposed in utero. And the thing that impacted me the most is that atrazine one, causes abortion in pregnant rats. And an EPA lab showed this, not me. Of those rats that don't abort, it causes prostate disease in the sons that were exposed in utero. It causes poor mammary development, and this is also done by EPA, EPA lab, in females that are exposed in utero. But what's more is when those rats grow up, they have, their offspring have retarded growth and development because their mothers don't have the mammary or the breast tissue to provide milk. In other words, this rat, the rat at the bottom, never saw atrazine. This rat at the bottom was affected by atrazine that its grandmother was exposed to. And that moved me more than any of the work that I've done personally, right? The idea that my grandchildren, that your grandchildren could be affected by chemicals that we're using today, even if we stopped your grandchildren could potentially be affected by chemicals that we're using today. Makes me realize that I have a much bigger responsibility than, than just a little boy who likes frog. So I, I'll stop at that and, and we have time for questions. Um, I'll try to figure out how to get back to you. I think I just made my cup disappear. Am I still, can you still see me or no? We can see you in a little insert, but yes, we can see you. Okay. All right. Questions or comments? 
Dr. Bauer. So Dr. Hayes, our, our country has regulated the use of other endocrine disrupting chemicals like bisphenol A and polychlorinated bisphenols. There are a few examples. What is it with atrazine? Why, what, why is it still so widely used despite all of the evidence that it has these adverse effects? It, well, it was so atrazine was just in the last week or so banned in Alaska, Puerto Rico, and Hawaii because of the risk to those environments. The EPA recently announced that it is a reproductive toxin to wildlife and to humans. Um, the EPA made a statement. <coughs> sorry, made a statement in a New Yorker <coughs> magazine interview about me and atrazine. They said that the impaired health and disease are weighed against the economic benefits of keeping a chemical in use. The bottom line is atrazine makes somebody a lot of money, so it's still in the market. But even those chemicals you mentioned, BPA, et cetera, it took years and years and years to get them regulated. And they're still problematic in, in both the sense that they don't just go away just because you stop using them. And also the, the a lot of the regulation, the strength of the regulation varies state by state. Got a question from Emerson. Yeah. So why did the chemical company want to invest in atrazine research if it knew it was just gonna like undermine their profits? Um, let's see. It's, it's a long story that I could try to shorten. One is that the EPA requires research when chemicals come up for review, so they had to do it. Second one is, I think their strategy was that if they got ahead of the game and hired the scientists who were doing the work, then they would have control over the data. So it, it creates a system where the, the company can say, say to the EPA, we're spending millions of dollars to study this, but as long as they have control over the data and they had control over me, because I was in a, a confidentiality contract with them, then nobody would get access to the data. The reason that the company and I split and ended up in such a big fight was I published the data um, independent of them and, and continued to do the research independent of their funding. I actually had a question just yes. in general. Um, it seems like you've faced probably a lot of pushback when you talk about your research. Um, where, do, where do you find the strength on a daily basis to just keep going no matter what um, forces you might encounter? Well, so the professional, the professional answers are that I really feel like I have a, a professional and a personal um, obligation. I think we as scientists have a responsibility to the public and to environmental health, to public health. Um, the other one is when I was a little kid, my father, you know, I grew up in a, in a you know, um, a, a low-income black neighborhood. My father never got the opportunity to finish high school. And my father told me, my father used to say, once you get the piece of paper in the wall, you can be just like them. You know, you can be the boss. You know, my, my father used to say, never find yourself in a situation where you let another man tell you when to get up in the morning, when to eat your lunch, when to go home to your family. When you have the paper, you can do whatever you want. So I had the paper. And you know, the company, the company tried to tell me what to do and when I could talk and when I could publish. And I said, no. My dad told me once I had the paper, nobody could tell me what to do. And so some of it was very personal, very personally dri driven. Um, but again, I think there's a much bigger sense of social responsibility and responsibility as a citizen. And and I and I firmly believe that. I went to school on scholarships, and so in some sense, taxpayers' money and 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 um, uh, uh, what do you call it? It was the benefit of people who really cared, and I try my best to give that back. I'm wondering if atrazine is known to adversely affect other systems in the body, like perhaps the cardiovascular system, given the fact that phosphodiesterase is pretty pretty widely utilized um, signaling molecule. Yeah, well, I mean, of course, there are many um, different phosphodiesterases. I don't know if it systematically blocks all phosphodiesterase. And, and I think you're thinking of, of probably blood pressure and um, the, the PDE that regulates cyclic GMP. I haven't heard from blood pressure, but there are many other effects that are that are that occur well below what's considered toxic range for the chemical. So I know it affects immune function. I know it has neural and behavioral effects. 
Um, I know that it affects the stress factors as well, but I don't know if the exact mechanism for all those types of effects are. So for a company, oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. For a company like Novartis, what sorts of toxicology tests are they expected to do on a chemical like atrazine to indicate that it's safe for, for widespread use? Well, first, first and foremost, historically, they didn't have to do anything because historically, most of these chemicals, you know, I, t I told you 1958 for atrazine, the EPA didn't exist until 1972. Okay, so for most of these chemicals, th there was no testing required. Most of them, like DDT and 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 um, components of Agent Orange and other herbicide, 2,4-D, those were tested in war. So DDT was used in World War II, and then they brought it back and said, "Great, let's use it on agriculture." So there were no tests required. So the, so the EPA in its defense have about eighty thousand chemicals that it has to catch up on and do testing. And up until a couple of decades ago, most of the testing involved high dose levels to look at toxicity and, and maybe cancer. So this idea that these low doses, like 0.1 parts per billion, can cause endocrine disruptive problems that aren't necessarily cancer, that's a fairly new concept. So the, the EPA didn't have um, demand tests for endocrine disruption until about 20 years ago, about the time that, that Syngenta, the Navarre's hired me. It's, that's changing. Um, is this chemical used in like um, anything else other than like agriculture? So the single biggest use is agriculture, and and the single biggest use of agriculture is on corn, but it's also used on so it's used on monocots. So it's also used on sugarcane, etc. Um, the second biggest use is in forestry. So when they cut the trees before they replant, they spray atrazine. So there are no weeds to compete with the trees that they plant. So the second biggest use is atrazine, but that pattern of use is very different. So with agriculture, they will be applying it every year. And, and, it, and it's sort of regulated because it's being applied to food. Whereas in the forestry, they don't apply it every year, obviously, because they don't cut down the trees every year, but they apply huge amounts in very concentrated areas, which creates a, a different problem than the agricultural use. In most states, it's, it's regulated, so you have to be a registered applicant to use it. You can't just go buy it off the shelf. But there are some states where you, where you can just buy it to use on your lawn at home. In Australia, actually, when you need to use, they use it in swimming pools to kill algae, where you literally have little kids swimming in algae in Australia. But, but I don't think it's used that. I'm pretty sure it's not used that way in the United States. Dr. Hayes, are there other endocrine disrupting chemicals that are on your radar as being particularly concerning? Um, we've been so occupied. <laughs> Excuse me. We've been so occupied with atrazine. We've studied oh a couple dozen other chemicals. We found some effects with other chemicals, but none as potent or as persistent as atrazine. Um, in terms of endocrine disrupting compounds, there's concern. You know, somebody mentioned BPA. Um, people have concerns about glyphosate or Roundup. Um, there's concerns about even ethyl estradiol. You know, birth control pill. Um, so we have one study that's going on in South Carolina right now, for example where the only national park in South Carolina, Concrete National Park, park where I grew up, you know, that's where I learned to love frogs, really. Um, it was reported that that park is contaminated with atrazine from agriculture and with ethanol estradiol from aseptic tanks. So we're studying the impact of atrazine and ethanol estradiol, you know, birth control pill, the combination of those two chemicals on multiple frog species that inhabit the park. So I was before COVID coming back to South Carolina um, about once a month doing water sampling and frog sampling and doing experiments back here. Um, but the most of the chemicals that, that we would talk about haven't been tested for endocrine disruption. In fact, BPA is a funny one though, because they argued, the companies have argued for years and years about BPA, which is used in plastics. But historically, BPA was developed as an estrogen, potentially to be used in birth control. So we knew when we made the chemical, it was, it was made for that purpose. Yet we spent a couple of decades arguing with the EPA and arguing with legislators about 
the endocrine disruptive capacity of EPA, when in fact that's what it was developed for. Is there any requirement to label foods treated with atrazine, so you think before you do that? There is now. So California has a law, I think it's called Prop 65, is it? Either Prop 65 or 62. And that law requires that you label compounds that might be a reproductive hazard. So in California right now, it's required to label products that have atrazine in them. That's not a federal law, so it depends on what state you live in. Dr. Hayes, we have a lot of students here that will be um, 10 years from now, clinicians, researchers. Uh, do you have any general advice for them? Uh, I mean, most of us are pretty passionate about um, correcting a lot of these issues we see in the environment. Any, any advice for them as they move forward um, on how they can make a difference? I, I think that you know, I never thought I'd be the type of person to say, write to your legislator. But I think um, being involved in that process and writing to your legislature about these and related issues can have a big impact, especially if you are professionally trained or academically trained in an area. Um, but even if you're not, anybody can write in, for example, to the EPA and register a comment about a chemical that they're about to register. I think um, that being active yourself politically is important, but I think it's probably more important that um, we reach out, especially those of us in the ivory tower, that we reach out beyond our campuses to educate people. Um, you know, as a scientist, you, at least I was, you know, heard this, this rhetoric, you know, don't be an advocate, let the science speak for itself and don't get involved. And, and I, I feel exactly the opposite. We're the ones who really need to get involved. I tell that story about my mom and the PNAS paper, right? Because we reward ourselves in academia for things that mean nothing to the most, to the most of the world. That at the time, my most important publication was a journal that my mom couldn't get access to. And even if she did, you know, we're scientists, right? You know how we write. Even if she had access to it, she can't read it and, and know what I'm talking about. So it's very important, I think, for us to get involved in educating the public about science. If we don't, we're seeing the consequences of it now. With COVID-19, we're seeing people who, as they're watching science unfold, going, well, first they said this, then they said that, nobody knows. Helping people understand the scientific process and that it's a process is critically important. Climate change is another example. Helping the public understand the science that goes into, um, you know, statements like those about climate change and what we need to do to fix it. It's critically important for us to get involved outside of the accurate temper. Okay, yeah, I think we have some questions in the chat. Also, okay. I think if you stop sharing your screen, it'll put you back at full. I, I can't figure that. I, 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 I'm barely used to Zoom. <laughs> and this one, I can't even figure out where to click. I don't see any menu or anything. I, oh, wait. I just, I, menu just showed up. Okay. There, there we, we go. Now? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had to learn to, I had to learn to use Zoom. Two days before my lecture started, because we have no in person, we can't even be on campus. So I'm I'm, well, I'm in my kitchen right now. This is where I teach my class from. So. <laughs> we're we're trying to load the uh, chat screen. It's just uh, taking a little bit here. Okay. I think Webex may, may be mad at us. <laughs> I, I just I just figured out so I can see it now. Somebody's asking about it in rainwater, um, and and if it affects if the timing's important. The, the important thing about atrazine is the effects it has during early development are much more longer lasting and potentially permanent. Whereas the effects it has on adults, like those frogs with the low testosterone and low sperm count, if we take the atrazine away, they'll return to normal. But the frogs that are exposed as tadpoles that turn into females, that's permanent. You could take the atrazine away and they will be that way for the rest of their lives. And so the same is probably true of humans. It's the, the critical exposure would be in utero when hormones are, are inducing permanent changes in, in development. Those are the times I would be most uh, concerned about. And the, the problem with the rainwater, I think something like a half million pounds of atrazine 
come down in the rainwater every year. So it goes up on particles and it tracks. That's why it was banned in Europe, actually, because France banned it and it was still coming over in the rainwater from Germany. So that's why the entire European Union banned it because it travels. Um, the, the USGS reports that they can measure atrazine in Minnesota from applications in Kansas. They can measure it in the clouds. And, and it makes it difficult for us because it's difficult to find a controlled area that's not exposed to atrazine. It's difficult to find frogs in the wild that are not exposed. And one of the things we're finding in our research now is that the exposure sens the sensitivity changes with each generation. So frogs are evolving very rapidly to respond to atrazine. So if you're looking at frogs that have been, you know, living near a cornfield that have been exposed since 1958, you can't predict what, what your findings would be like. So oh, it just my computer just said video is not oh now you're back. Um, we can hear you. Oh, somebody asked about epigenetics. We're doing that. We're now in our sixth generation of frogs that were exposed to atrazine five generations ago. And and again, what I said is we, we see increased sensitivity with each new generation, and we also see spontaneous sex reversal in certain familial lines of, of our frogs. There are also people who've shown in mice and in fish three or four generations down the road, um, you still see effects of atrazine, even though there hasn't been exposure for three or four generations. So that's happening, whether it's epigenetics or whether it's um, selection, that we don't know, that I have graduate students working on. Uh, someone asked if there are lawsuits regarding atrazine, yes. Um, there's one lawsuit that just cost the company over $100 million. Um, and, I, and I believe there are other lawsuits carrying on now associated with birth defects that occur in kids that are exposed to atrazine immunity. And I, I didn't get to talk about that, but there are a number of studies showing genital malformations and birth defects in humans that were exposed to atrazine in the womb. How many of you guys uh, read Dr. Hayes' open letter that I linked in the email? Okay. Um, so yeah, m most of our students here have, have read that open letter and have, have read um, about your work and learned about it here today. Um, is there any knowledge down that road that you could maybe impart upon our, our students as they uh, navigate this more and more complicated world day by day? <laughs> Well, I, I mean, I, I, you know, I, 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 I've been an advocate for diversity in academia and in science for a long time, um, even before. But now I see my involvement, for example, um, a number of the undergraduates, students that work with me come from families that work in agriculture. And it gives me a whole new perspective to be studying chemicals from an academic, right? Because I'm really interested in atrazine because it's helping understand the role of hormones in early development. So from an academic standpoint, it's a really interesting problem. But when you're working with a student who's thinking, wow, my parents were sprayed with this. Wow, I used to do the laundry of my parents' clothes that were that were covered in these chemicals. That, that helps you understand the importance of diversity in a whole new way to now have that perspective. Um, the importance of having a diversity of teachers from all kinds of backgrounds, whether it's LGBTQ or racial or ethnic or socioeconomic. Um, many people don't know about health disparities as it relates to cancer because they aren't taught about it. And it's because most of the people who teach don't come from backgrounds where that's an issue. That, that So I think <clears throat> the, the diversity, what it contributes to our teaching, how it affects the things that we study, how it affects the things that we, um, uh, how we present our studies and, and how we use those data. I think all of those things are increased in a, in a more diverse environment. In particular, in my case, being at a public university, we have an obligation to educate students that reflect the diversity that we have here in California. And, and I also tell people when you think about health disparities in cancer or COVID, it's another example where, where African American people of color um, are much more vulnerable to COVID. So when we're in a world, when we're in a country that in the next decade will be majority minority, 
where, where the majority of people will be non Caucasian. We really have to have an education system and really be doing research science and developing public programs that will address the majority of people in the United States. And, and even places like Berkeley, which has a reputation of being very liberal, um, we haven't done a very good job at, at it. And, and, and I think it's, it's uh, encouraging that my campus now is thinking more about diversity, equity, inclusion issues, but it's also discouraging that it took, you know, a COVID disaster and, and, um, and racial issues and a person's death before we really started to think about what we needed to do to change the environment and support a more inclusive and more equitable environment here. And I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful that we're going to do better. You seem like a hopeful person, so that's good. <laughs> do we have any other questions for Dr. Hayes? Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I know we, we tried to get you back in March, but you know the world fell apart. Yeah. Uh, we, we're we're hopeful that maybe one day in the future we'll have you here on campus when things are a little bit more uh, amenable to travel, especially across. The entire country, like like from California to here. So, um, yeah, this has been fantastic. It's my again. Wish I could have been there in person, but <laughs> yeah, we have plenty of barbecue waiting on you if you want to come in the future. So uh, don't tease me like that. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay. <laughs>